hey, I'm in Singapore, and you can't really, you know, talk about Singapore or understand Singapore unless you uh, learn about LKY, otherwise known as Lee Kuan Yew. Um, I'm reading this, and, you know, this is interesting because, you know, it's not just LKY that built Singapore by himself. You have quite a few other people, including Tommy Ko and uh, several other people with the last name Go, G-O-H. Uh, it's a little bit confusing, uh, but, you know, he had, you know, LKY had a team around him that was amazing. Um, but what's really interesting is how controversial LKY was because he was so blunt. And the reason for that was because of his practicality. He, he's known for saying things like, you know, we don't have an ideology in Singapore. We will do whatever works. And to get there, to get that credibility, you had to, you know, you had to explore all the options and you had to give it to people straight. And that's interesting because it, it sort of put LKY in a few difficult positions, uh, including this one. Uh, Tommy Ko, who's, uh, inter you know, by the way, Singapore is extremely diverse. Uh, Tommy Ko is a devout Catholic. And, you know, LKY was Peranakan. And, you know, that's really sort of a combination of um, what the origin would be best described as Chinese immigrants to uh, Penang and Malacca, who may or may not have intermarried with local Malays, but uh, who certainly adopted their culture uh, in Malaysia and then sort of combined it with Chinese culture. And I believe that LKY, at least on one of his, one side of, uh, of his Chinese ancestry, was Hakka. His daughter has a book uh, with the word Hakka in the title. Um, and let me talk about, just this is kind of interesting here, it talks about um, LKY, uh, it was, let's, let's, I'll just read it, it's Tommy Ko, and it says that, you know, I was disappointed with the prime, uh, well, minister, it's called Minister Mentor, Prime Minister LKY's views on race. He, LKY revealed that if his daughter had wished to marry a black African, LKY would have had no qualms telling her, quote, you're mad. Quite English. Uh, he went to school in England. Uh, he also expressed, LKY did, reservations about interracial marriages. So let me sort of take that quote and then read another one for you. And this is one uh, where it talks about uh, Singapore's foreign policy. And, you know, we, we look at Singapore's leaders from LKY to the present, use a vocabulary which suggests that Singapore adheres to the real, realist school, which takes a cold-eyed, unsentimental view of the world. The realist worships power and is usually dismissive of other considerations. How can a realist state attach so much importance to international law as Singapore does? And Tommy Ko says, Singapore's ideology is actually not realism, but pragmatism. Our adherence to international law is based upon utility and not morality. So what's really interesting is that Tommy Ko himself probably does not, you know, will not associate, you know, sort of combine or associate these two passages together. But of course, they are part of the same parcel because Singapore is, is founded on practicality. And I want to use this as a launching board to talk about diversity and race. What's interesting is that when LKY was growing, you know, was in charge and growing up in the 1950s you know, and 60s, you had a lot of segregation. It may have been you know, not because of the law, but because of culture, and quite frankly, just not enough immigration in several places, unless it was by force and or by carving out a plot of land that would allow certain immigrants to stay um, and to work inside. And when you look at the that kind of a background, that kind of a world, it actually does make sense for LKY to believe that it would be crazy for his very much Chinese daughter, practical Chinese daughter, to marry someone from a, a background that, you know, they would not necessarily have a high chance of having those kinds of values. And so you see that someone like LKY, who was very open-minded, and because of, you know, and, and quite frankly, you know, just extremely intelligent, you can see how 
people starting from him, no, from him and, and going far all the way back to other really smart people like David Hume in Scotland, uh, and you know, of course, everyone in between uh, over the last 300, 400 years, you can see how people have had this suspicion that there isn't enough commonality of values in order to make certain relationships work. And if you're interested in politics as a means for uh, creating society, a better society, this is very important because politics is, is simply the building of relationships, uh, which then allows you to compromise over time. Uh, that's one way to look at politics, at least within your own country. And what's interesting is, you know, LKY being practical and not moral um, w was right. Um, you know, if in fact in the 1960s his daughter had decided to, uh, you know, marry someone the ch you know, who was a black African uh, from middle of Africa all the way down, chances are, you know, because Singapore didn't have any black people here, what they did have were, were very dark-skinned Sri Lankans that were shipbuilders. And so you, look, you can see that from, from the idea that, you know, this, isn't, this relationship is not going to work out, that's due to a couple of factors, one of, one of which is just a lack of immigration uh, to Singapore from Africa. And the other one is just, again, this idea that you have different cultures and, the, you know, whether and it's just, it makes more sense from a practical standpoint to have your culture uh, to get along with somebody who's from the same culture. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, you have people in, in Singapore who are as black as black Africans uh, who, are, who are working on the ships, who are blue-collar workers. And, the, you know, it's, it's interesting for me as, an, as somebody who, was, who spent a lot of time in, in, the, in the U.S. Uh, to see people of Indian descent uh, who are six foot two, 240 pounds, um, and to not have this be uncommon. Um, and who, of course, are black in skin, almost black. Well, and you can, of course, figure out why this happened, right? These were the blue-collar workers, and, and that's, you know, they, those were the people that were selected to come to Singapore uh, to do the work you know, with their hands, and which eventually became a very skilled work, not just, you know, you know, which, you, know you had to figure out how to build a ship, how to repair a ship, and to get it out of the dock in time uh, so that it could continue on its way. Um, and, you know, you, this, this, this is really interesting because you see Tommy Coe, um, who is somebody who is, is interestingly enough, you know, as a Singaporean, somebody who believes in practicality also, but who does not, you know, who does not apply that, that philosophy to his relationships. And you can see that, that this is really interesting because, you know, LKY obviously is very well traveled, but Tommy Coe was able to uh, engineer a peace agreement, you know, well, really a post-Soviet Union, you no, know, after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, you had to have people going in from the, from the UN to try to piece together how uh, the countries that were under the satellite of the Soviet Union's central structure, what, what would happen to them? Because you had military bases, you had a lot of um, uranium um, depots uh, in order to advance nuclear technology, and you had those all over the world. Uh, that was especially under Soviet, um, you know, Soviet, we could call it occupation now. And, you know, what, what's interesting is that this Tommy Coe engineered a, a sort of peace, peaceful withdrawal of Soviet troops from places like Estonia, Lithuania, um, and, you know, the Baltics, basically. Um, this is, this is, I'm forgetting one of them, obviously. Lith Lithuania, Estonia, and um, there's one more. Uh, it's not Latvia. It's um, and I'm, I'm just sort of blanking at this point, um, but you know you essentially had um, a, quite a few countries that were, um, you know, in, in a position where, you know, you had to have a, a, a situation where people that were living there, uh, some of them wanted to stay. They'd been there for a long time. The Soviet Union, and, you know, you know, they were one of the victors of World War II, and so you had people living in these places since 1945 or even earlier. And so you had to figure out a way to piece together all these relationships, uh, you know, in, in a way that cr created some sort of continuity uh, without resentment. And a lot of people that were, you know, in Estonia may not have wanted to go back, uh, you know, to the Soviet Union or to Moscow. And so he was a part of that. And, you know, LKY, of course, was sort of, you know, the, 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 the somebody who was very much against the idea that the British or the West um, are, are better than the East, 
And so he was, he was often very combative. And you can see the differences here, whereas Tommy Coe could not be combative uh, simply because he had to negotiate uh, you know, between these two you know, major powers. And you, know, you think about Estonia, um, and you, know, you think about where it is today. It's one of the most you know, successful countries in the world. It's got a tiny population, uh, but it's very advanced in terms of technology. Well, had they not negotiated that peaceful sort of detente, um, you know, between, you know, all the way back when the Soviet Union uh, was in disarray, you know, we wouldn't have had this sort of, you know, situation where that area um, in, in the Baltics uh, would be as well off as it is today. And, and part of that is a debt is owed to Singapore and to someone like Tommy Coe, these diplomats uh, that got things done uh, because of compromise and because of building relationships. So you can see that, you know, on, on the one hand, you've got a situation where you have somebody who's, who's practical but also idealistic, and that's a great balance to have. You can also see that, you know, one of the problems with a lot of the um, situations we have, situations we have today, is based on something similar, where you have somebody that is not exposed to immigrants um, in in a way that facilitates a positive view of those immigrants. And of course, you know, we've always had immigrants. That's something that's, that's really interesting because it's just that we don't always notice them. We do notice them when they're a different skin color uh, or, or, or when they're a different religion uh, or if they have a headscarf or if they have a cross. Uh, they, they become more noticeable, but it's not always the case that, you know, we had borders all the time. It's not always the case that uh, we had a situation where you had to have a passport to go across a border. And it's not always the case that technology was allowed us to be tracked uh, wherever we went with satellites and cell phones and so on. And so, and, and cameras and, 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 you know, the whole security apparatus. And we, we, often, we tend to forget that. Uh, and that, that's a shame because, you know, ultimately the world has always been globalized. It's always had, had immigration uh, because if we've always had war. And whenever you have war, you have people leaving before and after and during, obviously. And so... What's interesting to me is that the world hasn't really changed because you go from that statement of, that LKY made and you look at the uh, antipathy towards immigration today uh, all over the world, you, you can see that this is something that has to change in order for us to sort of make a leap into a different social continuum. And what we need to do in order to do that is to understand LKY's you know, views. You know, he believed in that as a practical matter. Because during his time, segregation was normal. And because when you have segregation, it's very difficult to get the best of both worlds, even within one country, uh, the best of both cultures. And the point of immigration, the point of peace is to try to facilitate all these things. But in reality, in reality, what's happened is that, you know, if you have an exchange, a cultural exchange that's meaningful, in reality, it's happened on, on a very high level with diplomats like Tommy Coe, um, or it's happened on a very low level where you have short-term workers coming in and living in foreign worker dorms. Um, or in, you know, in, in, in my case, you know, if you go 25 minutes, if you had driven 25 minutes from my house or my, my parents' house um, in one side of town that's one hour south of San Francisco, uh, you would go to an apartment that had six or seven people that only spoke Spanish. Um, and then it's in a small apartment, uh, similar to a basic HDB flat in Singapore. Um, and, it's, and then to, even today, uh, that, that would have been about, about 10 years ago uh, in, in, in California, Northern California. Well, even today, uh, you know, foreign labor is typically segregated. So it's typically the low, the low sort of, you know, low level workers, the people that, quite frankly, uh, do a lot of the work that's necessary. Uh, a lot of these people today are in foreign dorms. If you look at um, to the point where that segregation has become a part of our life. And it's become such a part of our lives that, you know, it's we don't even think about the fact that you know, there's 6,000 people in, a, in, in, a, in an apartment complex, typically living on bunk beds, multiple bunk beds, like, a, you know, worse off than a basic college dorm. And we, we hear about this now because of this COVID-19, this coronavirus that's caused a pandemic, a pandemic. And now that we've we understand the different, you know, that certain conditions, um, living conditions, are better than other living conditions, and the weakest link within a society uh, can affect everyone. Uh, 
it, it's you know a situation where a lot of you know we have an opportunity to re-examine how all this is going to work. And if we end up in a position where all we do is you know sort of create uh, you know little like stickers that tell people to sit more than six feet apart from each other, uh, I'm not sure that's the best outcome because this gives us, us an opportunity to understand both Tommy Coe's viewpoint and and LKY's viewpoint. And what Tommy Coe was thinking about was a society where you could have people that, you know, that all of us, from a, not just the diplomats, uh, but you can have a society where everyone was exposed to different cultures and got the best of those cultures, uh, thereby facilitating relationships in the future. So the, the idea is that we today, when I think about, you know, when LKY, or back then in the 1960s, when LKY thinks about uh, a black African, you know, since he hasn't been involved in a lot of diplomatic efforts with Africa at that time, uh, you can see that he would think that these this culture would be completely foreign to somebody who is, you know, say Chinese and so on, um, a Chinese doctor, uh, which, which is really interesting because there actually are quite a few African doctors. You know, medicine is, is something that, that the African continent does a really good job, um, you know, developing. Um, and it's surprising that LKY might not have understood that. Um, you know, his daughter became a doctor as well, and um, a neurologist, and, and all kinds of things. Um, actually, she used to. She actually ended up working in um, in the emergency room, and then she ended up uh, working primarily with um, what, what we probably would consider a primary care physician uh, that would handle you know a lot of different clients, um, but not necessarily specializing in any one thing. Although she did eventually uh, specialize or in, in a few. I believe it was neuroscience, um, but don't don't quote me on that. Um, and so you, you look at that sort of a situation where, you know, okay, well, I was correct in the sense that borders, both physical and abstract, would, would make it more difficult for his daughter to succeed in a relationship, uh, and, you know, compared to had, you know, someone if she married from China, from Malaysia, or in Singapore. And in fact, you can point to, you know, Obama, uh, Barack Obama. And now, of course, you know, his... Um, he is the result of an Af very something very similar uh, of an African immigrant, uh, and you know, uh, marrying or being with a uh, somebody from a different culture. That relationship did not last, uh, and that, that's you know something that LKY. So that would be some evidence that LKY would have been correct in terms of the probability of a relationship lasting. Um, and you know, of course, that that probability he would, probably would not have expected that probability. Uh, probability to result in a future president of the United States, uh, which is where we see some gaps in the way that you know practical thinking, uh, you know, sort of fashions itself. And so, what 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 I mean to say is that if you are you know being having grown up in in America, when when I think about Indians, it was quite shocking for me to come to Southeast Asia and to see so many uh, tall and and you know um, just people who are uh, sort of Muhammad Ali types, uh, but darker. And w if you think of it that way, you can see a situation where, you know, you have a um, you have a, a situation in which LKY would probably be able to see his daughter with a Sri Lankan, uh, but not with somebody from Black Africa because of the lack of exposure, of the lack of exposure to the culture. And one of the reasons I think Anthony Bourdain is so popular is because he's able to bring people together through food. And that's primarily the way people have uh, managed to be, become friends is through food. You know, you invite somebody to your house, you share your food, and then you have a conversation um, that builds into something else. And, you know, the question is, you know, where are we on the spectrum of David Hume, uh, actually even Martin Luther, um, you know, was quite open-minded wanted the free flow, free flow of information, was very, very hostile to uh, this idea that any, you know, any one group was, had a direct connection to the, the divine. But of course, Martin Luther, I found out, was also extremely anti-Semitic. So you have all these situations over the spectrum. And, you know, and for the record, I, I, you know, I don't like concentration of power, so I, I am anti-Catholic church. Uh, I, I make sure I, I include the, the the entity and not not the individual in that spectrum, um, and and you know you look at say Churchill. Churchill was extremely racist, um, and you know it's really interesting how we have so many people in positions of power 
uh, that thought that way. And you know, and yet you have Chami Ko that, that does not think that way, who is from the same generation. And so the result of this is that we have a society that's been built on segregation because not just in, in, in almost everything, policing, it's easier to police, it's easier to do things uh, when you know, everyone is segregated in, in, into, a, into little buckets that you can understand. And, you know, but that's not something that's going to help us bring people together uh, and have a viewpoint that's more open-minded. And up, up to now, the point of the 60s has been that, you know, we wanted to smash those old considerations, um, those old belief systems that did limit the cross-cultural exchanges and cross-cultural relationships, the foundation for those relationships. And what we see now is, is sort of a reversion back to the 1940s and 50s where, you know, fundamental differences, at least visual differences, uh, were used, and, uh, used as, as an excuse to, you know, limit uh, the future, future possibilities because of practical considerations. In other words, the probability that somebody who is born from the same block would have the same values um, as opposed to somebody who is, you know, across, across the, on the other side of the tracks. Uh, much less in, in a completely different country. And what's, what I guess my point is that the whole point of a society here is to try to change that philosophy. And we, I don't think that, that I think that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves, um, as opposed to what is practical and what is moral, is how do we lay the, found, the foundation uh, for a society that can be both idealistic and practical and moral? And if we don't do that, we're going to end up in a, in a situation where uh, the security apparatus, just the, the, the people that want things to be simple, we're going to create a world where we go backwards and we have a more simple world, but not, not necessarily one that maximizes uh, creativity or, or that maximizes uh, relationships. And that's important because you, know, you, have, a, uh, you have this idea that a, a world that is that has less opportunities for um, for creativity or that has less opportunities for interaction with people who are different from you, you have this idea that, that that's, a, that's a world that limits creativity. It's a world that limits knowledge. And I don't what, I, what really bothers me is I don't see people trying to empathize with both LKY's you know viewpoints as well as Tommy Coe's viewpoints um, and to try to come up with a solution because right now, the, the entire economic system is actually based on segregation. You have houses in one, one area that are worth much more than houses in, in, in another area uh, in the same city, uh, merely, because, who are merely because of the location, um, not because of the housing structure itself. In my neighborhood, uh, an ordinary house, would, you know, this is the same size, um, you know, would be worth almost, in some cases, eight to nine times as much as the exact same house um, about a 20 to 25 minute drive away. And so why, again, that's because of segregation. You have this idea that certain, you know, tax revenues come in and then they get disseminated, they, they get distributed within that local entity. And, you know, as a result, you know, you have some tax dollars, you know, going into, um, you know, more versus less. Uh, that's trying, you know, California has tried to change that by shifting some tax revenues uh, to the state capital that's actually worse because you know if you divorce tax local tax revenue from your local police, your local police, which are supposed to be loyal to the local community, end up having a, a conflict of values. Now that's not you know, in, in, a, in a large area. Singapore doesn't have to worry about that. It's a small place, um, and so it doesn't have to worry about these distinctions. Uh, but you can see that sometimes having a solution uh, it can oftentimes be worse to the extent that it creates a wedge between institutions politically that are supposed to focus on the local and somehow creates uh, you know, multiple, multiple opportunities for divided allegiances. And that's what's happened in California. Um, and you know, despite this sort of best effort. So I'd like to say, you can say that California is, is idealistic. It tries to be moral, but it's not practical. And so no one's really figured out this, uh, how, how to create a society where you have uh, you know, a, a Barack Obama where the parents stay together. Uh, and quite frankly, it was quite difficult you know, back then, but it's probably equally uh, difficult today. Uh, and that's, that shouldn't be the case. So the question really we ought to be asking, and I don't really see a lot of people discussing it, is how do we create 
that kind of a situation where we can be both idealistic and practical. And the way to do that would be to smash segregation. But how do you do that when the entire economic system, which is linked to the policing system, how do you do that when segregate, you know, all of that is linked together? In, in other words, the values for similar items, or, or sometimes even the same items, uh, are inflated based on you know, lack of access or just based on segregation, um, location. And that's true internationally, which is why you see a lot of people you know, becoming nationalistic. Uh, in Singapore, if, you know, a lot of the food here comes from Australia and from Malaysia. Well, Malaysia is, is, a, is one of my favorite countries to visit uh, now. I didn't like it back then when I only went to KL, but once I went to places like Langkawi, um, I, and I really started to like it a lot more. Um, but the fact of the matter is, when I buy milk here from, or coffee here from um, Malaysia, or from Singapore, it's about four times ex as expensive as, you know, buying the exact same thing if I just drive across the border or take a train uh, 10 minutes uh, from here uh, to Malaysia. So this, you still have this idea of an economic system that's really based on tariffs, it's based on currency fluctuations, all of which create either formal or informal segregation. And that segregation is taking a toll because it makes it, it's making it harder and harder for us to envision a society where a black African and a Chinese, um, and a, you know, a daughter of a Chinese prime minister have an equal chance of staying together um, and having a child uh, as, say, two Chinese people within Singapore um, with the same, you know, regardless of the same educational levels. And no one's really discussing how to fix this because it's difficult. It's a very difficult question. Um, and thus far, the economic system has been based on things like currency, uh, unequal currencies, and things like tariffs, and things like you know that, that allow your domestic um, industries to prosper, especially in agriculture. So I sort of picked a, a, ba a biased example when I picked something that had to do with food. But you can do the same thing with, with clothing and some other things. Um, uh, that will give you a, a sort of a, 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 the same idea of, of just economic segregation uh, resulting in physical segregation that, that then results in cultural segregation. So these are just some thoughts. I don't have the answers. Uh, I'd like to start thinking about them, and it's easier to think about them when you collaborate. That's actually why segregation harms everyone in the end, because if, you, if, if I don't have someone to talk to about these issues, uh, chances are... You know, I won't be able to gain a solution because I won't be able to have a sounding board. Um, you know, the, the poets would call, call it a muse, um, M-U-S-E. But uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, a lot of great ideas have come through collaboration. And a lot of insights have come through collaboration, oftentimes from people who are different from you are. And I actually think some of that is biological. Uh, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm at this point, especially with the lockdown uh, due to the coronavirus, I'm probably the only person... Um, one of the few um, non-Asians and non-Southeast non Asians, you know, around here. And so there's some kids on, on, you know, nearby the flat, the apartment that I'm in. And, you know, they, they look at me with curiosity because I'm different. You know, these are babies. You know, they haven't quite had a chance to be completely socialized. And uh, some of the babies will just, you know, they, they cry, right? Babies get tired. Um, and so when they get tired, they cry. Uh, they don't, you know, and sometimes they don't want to go to sleep, and you know, it's, it's difficult to be, be a little kid. Um, but what you notice is that even though a baby will be full on crying, uh, not wanting to eat at that particular point in time, um, you know, I have to, I take out the trash and put it in the common disposable bin that goes all the way down the chute, down to a um, uh, a garbage um, crate. And so what you, what happens is sometimes I'll be walking by, and the doors here are still quite humid in Singapore. And so the, most people keep their doors open or their windows open, um, and especially if they're cooking. And sometimes I'll walk by, and these, these little kids, sometimes the little kid will just, like, stop crying. In the middle of, like, a full-on outburst, will just stop crying because she's noticed something different. Um, and it doesn't, it's not the same thing if just somebody else walks by who's not completely different. Um, so we tend to, there's probably a biological basis for listening to somebody that's different from you are, as long as they speak the same language. Um, and that's, that's helpful. That's one of the reasons that, that collaboration may work. Um, and the question is, how do we get it out of the providence or jurisdiction of diplomats? And how do we trickle that down to everyone? Hopefully, we can try to come up with some solutions.